Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to talk about the last three books in the Crestomancy series that I have finished rereading over the past couple of weeks. This is not going to be an overview of the Crestomancy series by any means, um, just my thoughts on rereading these last couple. So I have been rereading the series in internal chronological order, which is not the same as publication order and not the same apparently as Jones recommended reading order and it's been interesting rereading these in an actual intentional order because when I was a kid when I originally read the books I read everything that I could find by Diana Wynne Jones in an extremely haphazard fashion. I don't think that I even realized that a lot of the Crestomancy books belonged to the same universe until I was reading the last couple that came out when I was a teenager, pretty much. So I'm gonna talk about these in the order in which I read them. So um, right after the novel Charmed Life, I believe, comes two of the stories from Mixed Magics, which is the only collection of short stories in the Crestomancy world. So the stories that I read right after Charmed Life were um, Warlock at the Wheel, which features, I think he's called the Willing War warlock or something in Charmed Life. He's one of the secondary characters, a bad guy who has his magic taken away at the end of the story by Crestomancy. And he pays a sorcerer to send him to another world where he can regain his magic. And when he's there, he tries to rob a bank to get money, and then he steals a car. And as he is driving to get away, he turns around and finds out that there is a little child of indeterminate gender and a big scary dog in the back seat and they proceed to make his life hell. I really love this story. I remember the story from when I read it as a kid, unlike all the other stuff in this particular collection, and I still thought it was really, really great. And the other story that takes place between Charmed Life and Witch Week, I believe, is The Sage of Fear. This one was okay. I don't find it to be a particularly amazing or memorable story, but it was okay. And that is one that takes place in uh, one, one of the worlds of Crestomancy, um, the pantheon of gods likes everything to be very orderly. Everything is run on rules and you have regulations and everything must be exactly the way they want it to be, the way they prophesy it to be. And there is a prophecy that there will be a sage born who will start questioning everything and the gods just frankly cannot stand this. So when the child is born, they attempt to find a loophole in the prophecy. The child is taken to a different world and left there. But Crestomancy brings the child back after being in stasis for like seven years. And then the prophecy, which must happen, begins to reassert itself and timey-wimey stuff happens. And as the boy grows up, he meets himself. <laughs> um, it was interesting for the way that the prophecy had to happen. Um, so I, I like that, but the characters and everything weren't that memorable for me. And then after that comes the novel, The Magicians of Caprona, which is another of the books I read so early on and I never reread it that I didn't remember anything about it except that it supposedly had kind of an Italian vibe to it. This story is set in the actual world that Crestomancy lives in, and Italy is not a unified country. It's still a bunch of kingdoms and city-states, and one of those cities is Caprona, where there are two famous spell houses, the families of the Montanas and the Petrochis. And probably my favorite thing about this story is that the structure of it is kind of modeled on Romeo and Juliet. But instead of focusing on the doomed teenage romance, Jones focuses on the feuding families, the bad blood. Um, the Montanas and Petrochis hate each other's guts over something that happened many generations back that, of course, they're misremembering. Um, and the story, this is one of Jones's novels that I find it really hard to summarize what's going on in it because there are so many different things and to explain it, I have to explain the entire book and you should just read the book, but she manages to make it all fall into place at the end and I, I love that. When it, when it works 
in Jones's books, it really works. And this is one of the books where I think that happens. And basically there is some unknown threat to Caprona and magic in the city. There seems to be something like leeching the potency out of the spells that the, the families create. And because many of their spells literally underlie the foundations of the city, when those things start failing, that's bad. And there's war brewing amongst the, the states of Italy and such, and the children, particularly um, Tonino and his cousin Paolo from the Montana family, um, trying to figure out what's going on and seeing the things that the adults don't necessarily have time to see. I really enjoyed this one. I really liked Tonino and Paolo both, but Tonino is my favorite. He reappears in later stories, so I, I feel like he's the main character here. Um, and, and once again, the fact that it's based on Romeo and Juliet and the collisions between the families and the misunderstandings and everything, it was really interesting. Um, also, this was like the second time I came across Punch and Judy in fiction in like a month, where it's pointed out to me that the Punch and Judy like puppet show thing is horrific. It involves a guy like beating his wife and baby to death and stuff and and imagine that but with actual children turned into the puppets being made to do that to each other. Um, Jones definitely puts the bad stuff in her books and knows that kids can take it, I guess. But I was reading that passage just thinking, this is brutal. <laughs> it probably hurt me more as an adult than ever when I was a kid. But yeah, I got done reading this one and I just loved it. And probably because it was really different from a Charmed Life and Witch Week, which were not exactly disappointments upon rereading them, but I just really had difficulty with the children and the way they were behaving in those stories. And in this one, the kids are so different. And unlike in the previous couple of books, they come from, you know, families that are fighting each other, but within their families, there's a lot of warmth and love and friendship and everything. And I feel like that was an element that was really missing from some of the other books. So I'm so glad I reread this one because I remembered nothing about it and it turns out it's one of my favorite in the series. And then after that are the other two stories in Mixed Magics. Uh, so the next one is The Stealer of Souls, which is quite long. It's probably like a novelette or a novella and it features Tonino Montana from The Magicians of Caprona um, who is visiting Crestomancy Castle and he and Cat Chant are kidnapped by an evil sorcerer who is stealing the lives of nine-lived enchanters like Crestomancy and Cat Chant. Um, and they have to escape from this sorcerer and save the lives that he has stolen that still exist. I remembered snippets of this story from before, like it felt vaguely familiar, but I didn't remember the particulars. Um, I really like seeing Tonino and Cat together, and this I think that Kat may be the one kid in the series who gets the most development over multiple stories and multiple books. And I'm glad because I had issues with how he was like in Charmed Life. That was one of my bigger problems with that book. And in this story, he's growing up, he's very like aware of how jealous he feels that Tonino has shown up and kind of takes the spotlight away from Kat as the youngest and the special one. And Kat is basically told to take care of Tonino and he doesn't really want to, but he's worried that the way that he's feeling with jealousy and envy and stuff um, will turn him or is a sign that he's turning into an evil enchanter. Um, so that internal struggle that he has throughout the story was probably the best bit of it. Um, and then the last story in here is relatively unconnected to like the events of any of the books and stuff, and that is Carol O'Neill's 100th Dream. This is about a seven-year-old girl, I believe, who she can lucid dream, but she's figured out she can create dreams and record them and sell them, and so she's kind of made... She, she has fame and money, but also for her mother because of this, and when she sets out to dream her landmark um, 100th dream, she can't. Something goes wrong. Of course, everyone panics. Her mother takes her to all the specialists. They can't help. So they end up going to Crestomancy, and uh, he 
figures out what her problem is. I just thought the story was really great because it did not go the way I thought it was going to. The solution to Carol's problem was really on point with Crestomancy basically saying, children need to be children. You need to have childhood. You need to live your own life and have experiences before you can churn out stories and entertainment and have a job for other people. And that was a good message, I think. And then that leads us to the very last book, which is The Pinho Egg. This is the last book, I think, in pretty much any order that you read things. It's the last in publication order and the last in internal chronological order. And this probably is my absolute favorite Crestomancy novel. It seems like a great end to the series, the, the last Crestomancy novel that pulls together a lot of characters and a lot of the, the magic and the world building from previous stories and then adds more onto it. And I also feel like it really brings to the surface some of the themes and the ideas about adults and children that have been reappearing in the previous books. It just becomes more obvious in this one. This story is primarily told from the viewpoints of Kat and probably more importantly Marianne Pinho, and it takes place in the village near Crestomancy Castle. Marianne is from the Pinho family and the Pinhos and the Farleys and a third family are their witch families. They have like Dwimmer magic is what they call it. Um, they're very in tune with nature and herbs and, and stuff like that, but I think of them mainly as, as witches in the kind of classification system of the Crestomancy world. They're not enchanters or sorcerers, they're more on the witch scale. And they don't like Crestomancy. Crestomancy is basically the magic police. He stops people from using magic inappropriately or against the law, and these families don't like him because they want to use use their magic in the way that they want to and disregard the actual rules. And the story really kicks off when Marianne's grandmother, the like matriarch of the Pinhos, seems to lose her mind and starts a massive feud with the Farley family. And it is all focused on the fact that something very strange is happening in like the lands and the woods outside of Crestomancy Castle and around the village where things just don't feel right and these families are magically blocking people like Crestomancy from getting close to what's going on and Marianne and Kat are probably gonna be the ones who just punch straight through that barrier and open up what's been going on secretly. This is really difficult in some sections because near the end of the story, you find out what the adults have actually been doing and it is, it's horrible. There's this moment where Marianne finds out and she finds out that her own father has been, has done this thing and she just loses it and she tells them to their faces, this is evil, this is horrible, how could you have done this? Because it's, it's vile, it's twisted. Usually characters in these stories don't just come out and say things like that. A lot of them are like cat. They feel things, they're upset, but they never actually say it, they never verbalize a lot of those feelings, they have a hard time doing that. And that's another one of the themes in here is why? Why do characters like Kat and Marianne, why are they so stifled? Why do they always feel like adults aren't listening to them? And there's a part where Kat notices that Marianne, she's not a witch, she's an enchantress and her own family doesn't see that. They just constantly keep her busy and brush her off and basically say that she's not really worth their attention. When she starts believing in herself against what even her own parents are telling her, she really blossoms. She becomes very a very powerful force in the story. And Kat realizes when he points that out to Marianne that the same thing is happening to him. He just has to have more confidence and do things without 
necessarily getting permission from the adults first who aren't really paying attention. And I really like that. I think that a lot of the Crestomancy novels have featured this dynamic between adults and children, which is basically adults doing really terrible things and the kids having to live with the consequences of that or uncovering it and, you know, kind of being the victims of it, saying this isn't right. It's much more obvious in this one when the characters actually come out and say things like that. And that's probably why I loved it so much because I just read all these books in one big rush and I finally got that really satisfying people came out and said what they thought sort of scene and I was just, yes, you've said exactly what I was thinking for a couple of books. So. I really, really enjoyed this one. I think it's the only one of these books that I've given five stars to upon rereading. I think it really, really deserves it. And it was a good book to end the series on. It really brought the characters to life again, and it's also one of the books that feels more modern. Obviously, rather than being written in the 70s or 80s, it was written around 2005. It, it feels more modern, it doesn't have some of the old-fashioned writing or ideas or references in it, and I think that also made it more palatable to me in some ways, because there are a lot of old-fashioned things in some of the earlier written and published books that aren't present in the later ones that are not necessarily awful things, but are not considered appropriate now, I think. The one that immediately comes to mind is essentially fat phobia or the use of fat as a descriptor, like a constant descriptor in some of the earlier books, particularly in Witch Week, I think, and The Magicians of Caprona. And it's not that fatness is necessarily equated with villainy or evil or anything like that, but it's just constantly used and then it disappears in later books and it bugged me. I was trying to pin down like what is it about this thing? It keeps being used. I don't really like it. It just gets under my skin a little bit but not so much or at all in the later books. So there are things like that and this is possibly why I definitely liked the more modern books in the series better. My favorites are Magicians of Caprona, Conrad's Fate, and of course The Pinho Egg. And Conrad's Fate was published in 2000 and The Pinho Egg in around 2005, so there's a big difference there. But anyway, I think I'm starting to ramble about the series overall now. Um, I'm really glad that I reread these books, and I'm really looking forward to rereading some other things outside of the Crestomancy novels by Jones because she had so many books, and so many of them were some of my absolute favorites as a kid, and I'm hoping that some of them at least live up to my childhood nostalgia. So that's it for the end of my reread of the Crestomancy series, and I will be back to talk more about Diana Wynne Jones in the future, I'm very sure. Um, but for now, I think I'm going to turn my attention to rereading some other series like Discworld and the Ancillary Justice books by Anne Leckie and things like that. I need to reread some science fiction, <laughs> it's been a while. So um, let me know if you have any thoughts about Crestomancy or um, the books of Diana Wynne Jones. Thank you so much for watching this kind of tangential video, and I will talk to you again soon, and until then, bye.